The Perks of Being a Wallflower, December 26, 1991. Dear friend, I am writing in my bedroom now after the two-hour ride back to my house. My sister and brother were nice to each other, so I didn't have to drive. Usually on the way home, we drive to visit my Aunt Helen's grave. It's kind of a tradition. My brother and my dad never want to go that much, but they know not to say anything because of mom and me. My sister is kind of neutral, but she is sensitive about certain things. Every time we go to see my Aunt Helen's grave, my mom and I like to talk about something really great about her. Most years, it is about how she let me stay up and watch Saturday Night Live. And my mom smiles because she knows if she was a kid, she would have wanted to stay up and watch too. We both put down flowers and sometimes a card. We just want her to know that we miss her and we think of her and she was special. She didn't get that enough when she was alive, my mom always says. And like my dad, I think my mom feels guilty about it. So guilty that instead of giving her money, she gave her a home to stay in. I want you to know why my mom is guilty. I should probably tell you why, but I really don't know if I should. I have to talk about it with someone. No one in my family will ever talk about it. It's just something they don't. I'm talking about the bad thing that happened to Aunt Helen they wouldn't tell me about when I was little. Every time it comes to Christmas, it's all I can think about deep down. It's the one thing that makes me deep down sad. I will not say who. I will not say when. I will just say that my Aunt Helen was molested. I hate that word. It was done by someone who was very close to her. It was not her dad. She finally told her dad he didn't believe her because of who it was. A friend of the family. That just made it worse. My grandma never said anything either. And the man kept coming over for visits. My Aunt Helen drank a lot. My Aunt Helen took drugs a lot. My Aunt Helen had many problems with men and boys. She was a very unhappy person most of her life. She went to hospitals all the time, all kinds of hospitals. Finally, she went to a hospital that helped her figure things out enough to try and make things normal. So she moved in with my family. She started taking classes to get a good job. She told her last bad man to leave her alone. She started losing weight without going on a diet. She took care of us so my parents could go out and drink and play board games. She let us stay up late. She was the only person other than my mom and dad and brother and sister to buy me two presents. One for my birthday and one for Christmas. Even when she moved in with the family and had no money, she always bought me two presents. They were always the best presents. On December 24th, 1983, a policeman came to my door. My Aunt Helen was in a terrible car accident. It was very snowy. The policeman told my mom that my Aunt Helen had passed away. He was a very nice man because when my mom started crying, he said that it was a very bad accident and my Aunt Helen was definitely killed instantly. In other words, there was no pain. There was no pain anymore. The policeman asked my mom to come down and identify the body. My dad was still at work. That was when I walked up and my brother and sister, with my brother and sister. It was my seventh birthday. We all wore party hats. My mom made my sister and brother wear them. My sister saw mom crying and asked what was wrong. My mom couldn't say anything. The policeman got on one knee and told us what happened. My brother and sister cried, but I didn't. I knew that the policeman made a mistake. My mom asked my brother and sister to take care of me and left with the policeman. I think we watched TV. I don't think I really remember. My dad came home before my mom. Why the long faces? We told him. He did not cry. He asked if we were okay. My brother and sister said no. I said yes. The policeman just made a mistake. It is very snowy. He probably couldn't see. My mom came home. She was crying. She looked at my dad and nodded. My dad held her. That's when I figured out that the policeman didn't make a mistake. I don't really know what happened next. And I never really asked. I just remember going to the hospital. I remember sitting in a room with bright lights. I remember a doctor asking me questions. I remember telling him how Aunt Helen was the only one who hugged me. I remember seeing my family on Christmas Day in the waiting room. I remember not being allowed to go to the funeral. I remember never saying goodbye to my Aunt Helen. I don't know how long I kept going to the doctor. I don't remember how long they kept me out of school. It was a long time. I know that much. 
All I remember is the day I started getting better because I remember the last thing my Aunt Helen said just before she left to drive in the snow. She wrapped herself in a coat. I handed her the car keys because I always was the one who could find them. I asked Aunt Helen where she was going. She told me that it was a secret. I kept bugging my Aunt Helen, which she loved. She loved the way I would keep asking her questions. She finally shook her head, smiled, and whispered in my ear, I'm going to buy your birthday present. That's the last time I ever saw her. I like to think my Aunt Helen would now have that good job she was studying for. I like to think she would have met a good man. I like to think she would have lost the weight she always wanted to lose without dieting. Despite everything my mom and doctor and dad have said to me about blame, I can't stop thinking what I know. And I know that my Aunt Helen would still be alive today if she just bought me one present like everyone else. She would be alive if I were born on a day that didn't snow. I would do anything to make this go away. I miss her terribly. I have to stop writing now because I'm too sad. Love always, Charlie. December 30th, 1991. Dear friend, the day after I wrote to you, I finished The Catcher in the Rye. I have read it three times since. I really didn't know what else to do. Sam and Patrick are finally coming home tonight, but I won't get to see them. Patrick is going to meet Brad somewhere. Sam is going to meet Craig. I'll see them both tomorrow at the big boy and then at Bob's New Year's Eve party. The exciting part is that I'm going to drive to the big boy by myself. My dad said I couldn't drive until the weather cleared up and it finally did a little bit yesterday. I made a mixtape for the occasion it's called The First Time I Drove. Maybe I'm being too sentimental, but I like to think that when I'm old, I will be able to look at these tapes and remember those drives. The first time I drove alone was to see my Aunt Helen. It was the first time I ever went to see her without at least my mom. I made it a special time. I bought flowers with, a Christmas, with my Christmas money. I even made her a mixtape and left it at the grave. I hope you do not think that makes me weird. I told my Aunt Helen all about my life about Sam and Patrick, about their friends, about my first New Year's Eve party tomorrow. I told her about how my brother will be playing his last football game of the season on New Year's Day. I told her about my brother leaving and how my mom cried. I told her about the books I read. I told her about the song of sleep. I told her when all felt infinite. I told her about me getting my driver's license, how my mom drove us there and how I drove us back and how the policeman who ran the test didn't even look weird or have a funny name, which felt like a jip to me. I remember when I was just about to say goodbye to my Aunt Helen. I started crying. It was a real kind of crying, too, not the panicky type, which I do a lot. And I made Aunt Helen a promise to only cry about important things because I would hate to think that crying as much as I do will make crying for Aunt Helen less than it is. Then I said goodbye, and I drove home. I read the book again that night because I knew that if I didn't, I would probably start crying again. The panicky type, I mean. I read until I was completely exhausted and had to go to sleep. In the morning, I finished the book and then started immediately reading it again. Anything to not feel like crying. Because I made the promise to Aunt Helen and because I don't want to start thinking again. Not like I have this last week. I can't think again. Not ever again. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, that you wanted to sleep for a thousand years or just not exist or just not be aware that you do exist or something like that. I think wanting that is very morbid, but I want it when I get like this. That's why I'm trying not to think. I just want it all to stop spinning. If this gets any worse, I might have to go back to the doctor. It's getting that bad again. Love always, Charlie. January 1st. 1992. Dear friend, it's now four o'clock in the morning, which is the new year, even though it's still December 31st, that is, until people sleep. I can't sleep. Everyone else is either asleep or having sex. I've been watching cable television and eating jello and seeing things move. I wanted to tell you about Sam and Patrick and Craig and Brad and Bob and everyone, but I can't remember right now. It's peaceful outside. I do not know that. I do know that. And I drove to the big boy earlier, and I saw Sam and Patrick, and they were with Brad and Craig, and it made me very sad because I wanted to be alone with them. This has never come up before. 
Things were worse an hour ago, and I was looking at this tree, but it was a dragon and then a tree, and I remember that one nice pretty weather day when I was part of the air. And I remembered that I mowed the lawn that day for my allowance, just like I shoveled the driveway for my allowance now. So I started shoveling Bob's driveway, which is a strange thing to do at a New Year's Eve party, really. My cheeks were red cold, just like Mr. Z's drinking face and his black shoes and his voice saying when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, it goes through torture and how it takes seven years to digest gum. And this one kid, Mark, at the party, who gave me this, came out of nowhere and looked at the sky and told me to see the stars. So I looked up, and we were in this giant dome like a glass snowball, and Mark said that the amazing white stars were really only holes in the black glass of the dome. And when you went to heaven, the glass broke away, and there was nothing but a whole sheet of star white, which is brighter than anything, but doesn't hurt your eyes. It was vast and open and thinly quiet. And I felt so small. Sometimes I look outside and I think that a lot of other people have seen this snow before, just like I think that a lot of other people have read those books before. And I listen to those songs. I wonder how they feel tonight. I don't really know what I'm saying. I probably shouldn't write this down because I'm still seeing things move. I want them to stop moving, but they're not supposed to for another few hours. That's what Bob said before he went to his bedroom with Jill, a girl that I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is that this all feels very familiar, but it's not mine to be familiar about. I just know that another kid has felt this, this one time when it's peaceful outside and you're seeing things move and you don't want to and everyone is asleep. And all the books you've read have been read by other people and all the songs you love have been heard by other people. And that girl that's pretty to you is pretty to other people. And you know that if you looked at these facts when you were happy, You will feel great because you are describing unity. It's like when you are excited about a girl and you see a couple holding hands and you feel so happy for them. And other times you see the same couple and they make you so mad. And all you want is to always feel happy for them because you know that if you do, then it means that you're happy too. I just remember what made me think of all of this. I'm going to write it down because maybe if I do, I won't have to think about it. And I won't get upset. But the thing is that I can hear Sam and Craig having sex. And for the first time in my life, I understand the end of that poem. And I never wanted to. You have to believe me. Love always, Charlie.